We don't need the tax breaks. You need them. When the President of the United States talks about budgets, the numbers are in the trillions. But what's it like in a small country which has a budget like a small city? And are there lessons that small countries can teach large countries? We'll talk about those issues next on Global Perspectives. This program is made possible in part by funding from the UCF Global Perspectives Office, the Global Connections Foundation, and the India Center at UCF. This is Global Perspectives with Pulitzer Prize winning commentator John Bercia, Special Assistant to the President for Global Perspectives at the University of Central Florida. Welcome to Global Perspectives. Life is tough for any nation in today's complex world with seemingly endless challenges from economic turmoil to climate change. But the burden weighs most heavily on small countries, those with populations of 1.5 million or less and limited financial and natural resources. What is it like to be a small country in the 21st century? With so much attention being paid to powerful players, such as rising powers, China, Brazil, and India, can small countries survive, compete, and thrive? The Isle of Man certainly has shown that it can, and today's guest, Peter Long, will help us understand why. As chairman of Capital International Group, headquartered on the Isle of Man, he has contributed to the island's growing stature and influence. Welcome to the program, Mr. Long. Thank you, John. It's a great pleasure to be here. Thank you for joining us. Tell us a little bit about the Isle of Man for the benefit of viewers who may not know that much about it. Well, we're a very small island. Um, we have a population of about 80 to 85,000 people. And that population has been growing quite appreciably over the last 40 years, 50 years. Uh, the island has a very long history of self-government and autonomy, and it has been through some very tough times and some very good times. And that's why I think the island um, has some quite interesting lessons to learn um, about w what, uh, how you can start again when things go wrong, or how you can save money when things are going well. Uh, one of the things the island does so well is to ensure that we always budget for a surplus every year. The government budgets for a surplus. doesn't mean to say we always end up with a surplus, but if you don't budget for a surplus, inevitably you're going to end up with a deficit. And that's how many of the small countries and indeed larger countries have got into such heavy debt uh, today because those basic rules have not been obeyed. Let's talk about the island itself. What are some of the prominent features, both, both old and new, that um, explain the Isle of Man? Well, uh, if we go back uh, a thousand years or more, uh, the Vikings uh, came from Norway and they uh, raided all the Scottish islands and they came down through between uh, Scotland and Ireland and uh, found the Isle of Man. If you turn the globe upside down and uh, look at the way the Vikings came through between England and Scotland, you'll see how strategically important the Isle of Man was as, a, as a, uh, an island at that time. And if you could control the Isle of Man, then you controlled really the, the waterways going through uh, between these uh, uh, countries. We uh, have a long history of uh, uh, Viking artifacts and things that have been found all over the island. We pride ourselves in having the longest continuing, uh, uh, continuous parliament uh, in the world. It's been going for over a thousand years. We call it Tinwald, which is a derivative of a Viking name. Our parliament is self-governing. Uh, we have uh, the queen as our, as our head of state, and in the older uh, periods, perhaps going back 40 or 50 years, she exercised her control over the island through the lieutenant governor. And uh, the lieutenant governor um, sat in Timwald, and he uh, uh, was really responsible for the governance of the island. 
And then gradually over the last 50 years, because we're a very independent nation at heart, the uh, local politicians have been able to uh, create a, a system of very, very um, high quality governance. And so we've been able to take back uh, the power from the Lieutenant Governor to the Parliament, which is really where it should belong. And uh, eventually, some 20 years ago, 30 years ago, uh, the Lieutenant Governor um, uh, handed over to a President who was appointed um, uh, to, to um, oversee Parliament. And the Lieutenant Governor's role now is very largely ceremonial or when something seriously goes wrong in the island. Tell us about some of the other prominent features. You have beautiful Victorian structures on the Isle of Man. It is <coughs> one of the beauties of the island is the countryside. We have um, mountains all the way down through the middle of the country and the sea is never very far away. Uh, it's easy to get from A to B. We have um, um, about 30 inches of rainfall a year in most of the low-lying areas. It goes up to 60 or even 90 inches in some of the hilly areas. We have a population that is um, concentrated largely on the east side of the island in a marvelous bay called, called Douglas. Uh, it's a bay of about a mile and a half long all the way around, so it's a very beautiful part of the island. And that was developed in the Victorian times uh, as a tourist um, destination for people very largely from the north of England and uh, Liverpool, Manchester and the industrial areas. And they used to come over every weekend by steamship, um, perhaps five or even ten steamships um, a day used to come into the island, um, bringing five or ten thousand tourists at a weekend and uh, they would just love it. And uh, the wealth that that brought the island enabled us to build uh, these gorgeous Victorian um, uh, promenades that uh, you will see featured all around the island. And those are also helpful today in terms of being attractive to the movie industry. Yes, but of course some of the island's houses go back for two, three hundred years and um, the movie industry likes the variety that they can get when they come to the island. But from an economic uh, roller coaster point of view, that was our high point uh, um, in, in, uh, just before the First World War in the late Victorian, early Edwardian days. And then gradually after the First World War, the aircraft came in and um, uh, tourism uh, dropped very significantly and so did the wealth of the island. And the population started to decline. And what happens when a, a small country uh, doesn't have the economic um, structure to uh, provide work for its inhabitants, they will tend to leave and go elsewhere. Uh, and we saw it in Ireland in the Irish famine, in the potato famine going back 150 years. And in the island uh, between the uh, ending of the Second World War and the commencement of financial services on the island, we, we had a very, very uh, difficult period when population was down to something like 50,000. Tell us about the financial services sector. You obviously <coughs> understand it particularly well, and this has been one of the success stories that people in other countries have observed. All these things start with a little bit of luck, and you have to take full advantage of the luck when you, when you have it. Um, Back in the uh, late 50s, uh, um, early 60s, the uh, government in the United Kingdom uh, introduced surtax, uh, which took away uh, from the wealthy uh, English um, uh, uh, people something like 97.5% of their income. In fact, even at times, it went over 100%. And um, the Isle of Man decided to, we, we normally comply with uh, the same uh, um, customs uh, and excise tariffs and that sort of thing from the UK. But we decided to abo abolish um, surtax in the, in the island. And that encouraged uh, quite a few wealthy people from Britain, uh, from uh, England and Scotland and Wales to come across to the island and settle. And um, from there, the fortunes of the island started to pick up. We realized that there was a future 
uh, in financial services, but we had some terrible accidents on the way with uh, banks failing, um, very, very poor regulation. Well, there was non-existent regulation really in those days. And so we had to turn to the Bank of England for help on regulation. And um, uh, that was really um, a very good move because the cooperation with the United Kingdom was very helpful. And so the financial services industry sprang from that very small base. It attracted a lot of people in from England and from Ireland. So the population started to rise. Uh, the income of the island started to benefit so that the government could spend more money on infrastructure and education and health, all the things that are vital for the economy. But it isn't just financial services. Uh, we've also concentrated on uh, putting manufacturing um, industry into the island. We've got one or two world-class manufacturing companies. Uh, Strix is one that make the little controls on kettles all around the world. I think something like 90% of them are, are made by Strix. Uh, they've since uh, moved their factories to China and places like that uh, because the cost of making it is so much cheaper. Uh, we also have a big aircraft um, and uh, um, clutch of aircraft industries um, on the island. Rollinsway Aircraft is one. Um, uh, an, another uh, company uh, that makes uh, valves and things for high quality jets, the A340 and the, the Boeing uh, airliners are made, uh, those little components are made on the island. Swage Lock is the company involved, which is a big company here on on uh, um, in, in America and the subsidiary out in the Isle of Man has got, I think, the best record for delivery and um, 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 quality, which is brilliant. So the island has diversified, its film industry has, has helped. We also started an aircraft um, re uh, registry and before that a ship registry. And so the number of ships that are registered on the uh, Isle of Man ship register is now larger than the UK register, for example. And we demand very high standards of ship uh, safety and inspection and uh, uh, health of crews and that sort of thing. And it's worked extremely well and helped diversify the economy. But overall, uh, financial services is, is the big daddy. It attracts um, uh, legal, uh, so we've got uh, some very high quality lawyers on the island. Uh, all the big four accounting firms are there. And there are probably a couple of hundred uh, corporate service providers who provide structures for um, companies and individuals from all over the world. Mm -hmm. And uh, then we have to go out and sell ourselves. Mm. Right. And, and I think it's fascinating that as the Isle of Man has become more successful economically, you have taken increasing interest in the issues and affairs of other small countries around the world. And uh, this includes the establishment of the Small Countries Financial Management Center on the Isle of Man. Tell us a little bit about your involvement with that program. I've been a, a, a member of the governing body of the International Business School on the island for seven or eight years, which is just recently amalgamated um, uh, with the Isle of Man College, so we're a much bigger unit now. And the small countries uh, uh, met, met at the International Business School um, headquarters. And that's how I really got to um, see uh, these people coming in from all over the world with their different problems. And um, I felt that one of the ways that they could remember what they'd learned and the people they'd met on the island was to have a nice farewell um, uh, celebration for them. And being in financial services, I had a good range of connections all around the island. I make it a point to uh, have communications with as many of the political leaders and the senior civil servants and business leaders as I can. And so it was reasonably easy for me to create a, a, a dinner in the first year that we did this four years ago. Uh, and um, it was a great success. We, we had um, Manx traditional dancing, we had singing, and uh, we just made them all relax and come up in national dress. And we had uh, 15 or 16 tables. We had one politician on each table. We had two participants from the uh, Small Countries program on each table. And we filled up the rest of the tables with business people. 
you have a group of individuals from small countries who go through the Small Countries Financial Management Center program every year. Yes. And through that program, you've developed a connection with UCF, and we now have the Isle of Man Small Countries program here at the university. So it's a wonderful complementary relationship uh, across the Atlantic. Well, it's a great, great compliment to us that, um, that you are taking this uh, wonderful concept uh, forward. Tim Cullen, who I think you've already uh, interviewed, uh, is the, the uh, used to be with the World Bank and has seen all the poverty and difficulties that small countries around the, the, the globe has have suffered. And uh, he uh, liaised with the then Treasury Minister on the island, who agreed to provide the Seacorn funding to get the project underway. And uh, it, these things grow on you when you realize how appreciative the participants in the program are when they come to a small island like ourselves, see the history that goes back a long way, see the difficulties that we've suffered, the good times that we've had, and how uh, we can actually provide quite a good uh, um, story for them, not to be done, uh, not to be too depressed if things go wrong, uh, because there's always a light at the end of the tunnel. Uh, seek help. We can communicate with ourselves. The small, all the small countries can communicate. One of the biggest difficulties that the Isle of Man has is how to um, how to deal with the bigger countries, because it's very difficult for us to have a voice at uh, G20 or any of the uh, big country organisations. And uh, the small countries tend to get wrapped up together in one basket, uh, just small com uh, countries. But they, are, they, are, they have a one big disadvantage, and that is that, by and large, they don't have um, the critical mass that you need to create uh, a prosperous economy. Uh, the Isle of Man, I think, has been extremely fortunate. We've had uh, rising economic growth now for the past 27 years, averaging 4, 5, 6 percent uh, growth, which is really quite remarkable. And it's as a result of the conservative nature of the government, always putting aside money for a rainy day, never budgeting for a deficit, and, and therefore we've been able to keep out of this terrible debt trap, which has not only hit the small countries, but so many of the bigger ones as well. Now, the small countries are clustered in particular locations around the world. Could you talk a little bit about, about those? Well, the Caribbean, which is <coughs> the nearest to you, has probably got the biggest cluster. And um, uh, we've had uh, uh, members or participants uh, from senior levels in government. We, we tend, our, our particular program is geared towards um, uh, uh, trying to assist small countries improve their govern governance, um, uh, both treasury management, um, dealing with their political masters, um, regulation, uh, how to keep dirty money from coming near the island. The Caribbean is one group of uh, 10 or 12 small countries that uh, we look to um, come through and participate. There's another group in the Pacific, Samoa, uh, Vanuatu, uh, all this kind of um, um, small uh, uh, territories. And some of them, Samoa, for example, after they came on their um, a conference uh, two, three years ago, they had a most dreadful earthquake. And all the small countries that were on that particular uh, program all communicated with the Samoan representative and so there's a feeling of uh, bonami and comradeship which helps when things are going badly. So what would you say is the, the most challenging issue for small countries today? Is, is it the, the difficulty in being heard? Um, wh what can be done to help these countries be more significant players in the mainstream? That's a very challenging question. Um, I, I think the first thing that the small country has to do is to realize that there are friends who are trying to help it around. Uh, if we take the Isle of Man, for example, we're very close to the United Kingdom. We're not a part of the United Kingdom, 
um, but 80% uh, of our trade is with the United Kingdom. So there's no point in us trying to cast ourselves off, as a small minority of um, Manx people would want to do, and cut our links with the United Kingdom, because that would just be shooting ourselves in the foot. I suppose bringing in materials, food, uh, clothing, that sort of thing, is a, is a big challenge. How do you get it in? Uh, we're 60 miles from, from the Lish coast, so we can bring stuff in by ferry quite, uh, quite easily, but it's very expensive. So cost of uh, communicating with the outside world by air or by ferry is, uh, is another big challenge for everybody. Education and health, well, uh, this is something that uh, the island has got to find its own niche in the world. What is it? Is it going to be tourism? Is, is there a mine there? Is it going to be mining? We were talking with uh, one of your um, uh, uh, colleagues uh, from one of the Caribbean companies and uh, countries, and they've got bauxite, which they can mine, which uh, is a secondary uh, source of revenue to tourism, but most of them, of course, rely on tourism. And that's very difficult at this uh, time when economic conditions are not, uh, are not that good. Good. Well, thank you very much for joining us today, Mr. Long. Thank you, John. It's been a great pleasure to be here. And uh, uh, I think my trip to Florida has been uh, very exciting. When you see how small the Isle of Man is and how big just Florida is, one state in the United States. It's a great privilege to be here. Great, thank you. And thank you for Global Perspectives. I'm John Bercia. We'll see you next time. This program is made possible, in part, by funding from the UCF Global Perspectives Office, the Global Connections Foundation, and the India Center at UCF.